Right, hi. Um, my name's Matt Stanfield. Um, some of you may be aware of the uh, Lost Species Day initiative, which I'm associated with. Um, thanks so much for having me. And I should probably also thank uh, Beth Windle because uh, she recommended me to, um, to Chris to talk at this event. Um, or maybe I should blame her, depending on how well this goes. <laughs> um, anyway, I'm here today to talk about um, personal and public paleo art um, in terms mainly of the context of science communication and of species that have gone extinct recently and whose extinctions are linked <coughs> to human activity. Uh, that, by the way, is um, something that I... That's actually a sketch of a tattoo design that um, I'm planning to get in the new year. That's Megatherium and some leaves. Okay. So, um, part one, um, like anthropogene paleo art, and this is a term that I kind of settled on while I was amalgamating various ideas for this talk. Uh, basically, it's sort of a portmanteau, obviously, of anthropos, human, and um, genos, which is birthed, amongst other things, or made. So, human birthed, I guess, or um, sort of uh, human created, I guess, is the idea that I wanted to go with. And that's not really in the literal sense of these images being made by people, but in the sense of the animals sort of constituting paleo art because of human activity. Basically, uh, the idea is that they are prehistoric um, as a result of our activities towards them rather than as a result of other causes. And I'll be looking at this idea from both a personal and public communications perspective because one of the aspects of Lost Species Day is um, encouraging communal um, artwork. As you can see here, we've got um, just a half-sized Stella sea cow that's made for one of these years, this year's events. It's not quite necessarily um, proper paleo art because we do, it's not really a prehistoric extinction, but um, I think it's quite a striking example of, I guess it's kind of on the fringes of that, I think it's quite a striking example though of a community project. Um, this was built by several people. It's uh, a wood and papier-mâché thing and during the event um, members of the community were invited to paint um, conservation messages on it, um, sort of promises to the future, that kind of thing. A lot of extinction symbols went on it and then it was ritually burned. It took, yeah, it took a really long time to burn it actually because <laughs> it was raining really heavily. Um, So, um, in terms of content for anthropogene paleo art, um, as I mentioned, this applies to species or <coughs> ecosystems whose extinction or annihilation humans are widely considered to be the decisive factor for. Um, obviously, that's pretty controversial in terms of exactly what caused some of the um, uh, late quaternary, um, Holocene, Pleistocene extinctions, particularly going further back. Uh, there's actually, as, as some of you are probably aware, there's a high-profile new book out um, about this, End of the Megafauna, which features many illustrations by Peter Schouten, that, um, so which definitely fall into like, the very high end of anthropogene paleo art. Um, but the author himself, uh, Ross McPhee, he kind of, I kind of get the sense that he, um, he doesn't really want to sort of go too far down the route of, uh, sort of humans did it. But on the other hand, um, he sort of tacitly admits kind of in the last sentence or two that there was sort of a, a human fingerprint on it. And to be fair, it's not something that he just denies, but, um, and obviously it was, you know, probably a combination of factors that led to some of these things. You know, you have climatic stress and then humans deliver the coup de grace. But these sort of large scale collapses all over the world, you know, kind of around the time or shortly after a new and dangerous big game hunting super predator turns out do seem a bit coincidental to be just dismissed. Um, so I guess, yeah, the, the overkill hypothesis in one way or another does continue to be um, indicated as at least being partly accurate by research. And this here is um, this here's one of the earlier ones, um, one of the earlier megafaunal extinctions, Zygomaturus trilobus, which is kind of um, sort of a, like imagine a, a giant wombat cross of a rhino living in a swamp, and that's, that's kind of how this animal was, as far as we're aware. We've got the um, extinction symbol in the uh, upper left-hand corner as well, which is something that's been sort of more prominent in the media lately with um, Extinction Rebellion. Um, that's used quite a lot there. Um, sort of earlier on, um, back when Lost Species Day was sort of getting started, 
the individual behind the extinction symbol was uh, quite heavily associated with what we were doing. So um, various of the artworks that are produced for and around this have extinction <coughs> symbols on them. And the extinction symbol basically, amongst other things, has to do with anthropogenic extinction. Zygomaturus um, actually kind of went extinct um, over a sort of period of several thousand years, maybe tens of thousand years actually. The ones in the, um, in the very south of Australasia, so the ones in Tasmania, went extinct quite a long time after the ones in more northerly parts, which is quite often the case actually. You have um, the extinctions further away from where humans are thought to have entered continents do tend to be slightly later than the ones closer to. Although in this case, again, it's hard to say for sure. And yeah, one other thing actually that I noticed when writing this is chronology. Um, it may seem like kind of a facile question, but um, particularly in this context, we're dealing with stuff that's on the fringes of um, fringes of sort of what you might call, you know, the uh, historic age. Is what actually qualifies as prehistoric? And this idea is, um, if you've studied history, this idea is actually incredibly controversial. Um, there's endless arguments about this because uh, um, in the past it was used, um, the idea about history was used to justify all kinds of um, racist activity because history is seen as being related to written or so verbal or visual records either written or drawn. Um, so oral cultures were described as having no history and this was um, one of the uh, many justifications that we used for subjugating them. So the um, Aborigines, for instance, in Australia, when the British turned up, were said to have no prior history. So uh, there was no, so technically speaking, um, you could say that there was no um, interference with their way of life because um, technically speaking, you say they didn't have a way of life since they didn't record it. And you know, back in this uh, back in this area, you know, the 19th century, these sort of specious justifications were actually quite problematic. So <coughs> I've come up with like three possible cutter points that you could talk about in terms of where prehistory ends and history begins. The oldest one is about 5,000 years ago, which is when people first started using writing. So um, that was in the Middle East. Obviously, in the rest of the world, people didn't write anything down. Hieroglyphs came along a little bit later, so about 4,500 years ago. So um, by the traditional definition of history, history kind of begins around about then. So um, it's sort of the earliest date. 2,500 years ago is when the first work that's generally recognized as history in the modern sense is created by a guy called Herodotus who wrote not just about events that happened in the past but tried to explain why they'd happened. In this case it's about the uh, Greco-Persian um, Greco War but um, that's got kind of an analytical and a chronological aspect to it. You can go as recently as perhaps 500 years ago which is when the, uh, the modern age is seen as starting so when you have the, sort of the beginnings of globalization and uh, you have um, increasingly global records due partly to, you know, the age of discovery, which was, um, you know, probably less of a sort of experience of discovery for the people being discovered. Uh, I would say, personally, it's hard to draw the line exactly, but I would say somewhere between 2,500 and 500 years ago would be the very latest cut-off point for prehistory, probably, I would say, closer to 2,500 years ago. Interestingly, in uh, megafauna, they go up to about 1,500 years ago, in uh, about 500 years ago in terms of what they illustrate. So, it goes up to things like the mower. And uh, yeah, this here is um, definitely something that comes into prehistory. This is um, one of the um, Antillean ground sloths um, called Acrotophnis ye. I deliberately chose to illustrate a really obscure animal when I was doing this. The reason is that uh, the more obscure something, the more obscure creature you pick by default, the fewer better images of it there will be. <laughs> <laughs> now, the extinction of this species um, may or may not be linked to human arrival on the Antilles. Some of the Antillean ground sloths do seem to have disappeared around about um, the time that humans arrived there. The fossil record, though, um, as ever is patchy, and you always need more than what you have. So this animal died out 8,500 years ago or less. So it's kind of unclear. Um, I do wish I'd made it look smaller, actually. There was one where it did look smaller, because I kind of drew that thinking it's about two metres high. It's actually about one metre high. So it looks bigger than it was. Um, but at least it doesn't look like any extant animal too much. It went through phases of kind of looking like a... Because I drew it from uh, sort of the legs up. It went through phases looking like a kangaroo, then kind of like a bear. Not like an otter for a bit, actually. Um, <laughs> uh, it's, uh, you know, it's tricky with an animal that doesn't have like a close analogue to make it look kind of like a real animal, but at the same time not exactly like an animal that you 
would see today. Um, so about public engagement with um, anthropogy and paleo art. As I mentioned, the Lost Species Day initiative has, okay, has a strong public outreach component. Um, I've done some work in the past in terms of going to schools, uh, particularly um, done some work with uh, special needs students, students with behavioural issues, um, primary school students. And one of the things about um, visual art is that it's something that, is, it's something that crosses over quite nicely in terms of uh, language and ability. So you can, um, you can engage people of all abilities with it. And um, amongst the things that um, I've done have been uh, um, block printing and bringing in books of uh, various extinct animals for uh, students to have a go at drawing or even maybe sculpting a bit. And it's not always the obvious ones they choose. They don't always go for mammoths or saber-toothed tigers or dodos. A lot of them do go for dodos. But um, one of them went for um, giant beavers from North America, which was an interesting choice. Um, and they do, you know, people do seem to connect with it. Um, one, one girl said, uh, dodos aren't extinct, they're alive in my heart, which was quite <laughs> sweet. Um, uh, yeah, for me, acquiring knowledge and conveying as much of that knowledge as possible to others is kind of what um, Lost Species Day is about. For me, it's, it's an initiative that doesn't have any kind of overarching structure, so some people see it very differently. Uh, but for me, uh, the learning and telling stories part is the important bit because I think that it makes it, it, makes it more real, you know, um, and also the more you know, uh, the more you, the more valuable it is to actually consider things like um, anthropogenic extinctions, because uh, obviously, in the absence of um, workable de-extinction methods or ethical de-extinction methods for that matter, um, the best thing we can do about anthropogenic extinction is to learn from these issues, to learn as much as we can about exactly why they happened, in order to have better ideas of how to stop more of these things happening in the future. Um, so this here is a um, giant elephant bird, Eupionis maximus. That's again one of those ones that's kind of on the fringes. We don't know exactly when this species went extinct. It's thought to be maybe a thousand to about 400 years ago, depending on whether or not um, this French governor who wrote about it was writing from life or writing from folk memory. Uh, a lot of the Malagasy extinctions are a bit ambiguous when they actually happened. And that's kind of an iconic recent loss though. To be honest, I mainly draw, personally, I mainly draw the sort of fancy of bigger animals, um, just because I find them more exciting. But um, other people do the smaller ones, which is nice because somebody has to think about those things. This here is actually one of my favourite things that um, people have done in a community. This, um, this was something they did for a, a Lost Species Day event in Fiji. They made a life-size papier-mâché um, arboreal crocodile. This was a community project, and this was amazing. A that it was something that was done on the other side of the world from where this was set up, and B, that it's, you know, it's a life-size, really impressive-looking animal. It's quite compelling. If you saw that at a distance um, at dusk, <laughs> you might be a bit alarmed. And also by their inherent nature, some of these projects, so something like this, it's not just something that people, um, people would have their attention grabbed by. It's something that uh, if you worked on something like this, if you were sort of part of physically making an animal like this, or physically making a memorial like this, it makes the, you know, it makes the uh, loss seem more real. And it, I guess the idea partly is to sort of, um, by having people focus on, focus closely on one extinct species, kind of maybe encourage them to focus more closely and see the wonder in extant species and not just uh, overlook you know, the current wave of extinction as much. Move on. So this is um, this is something that I did recently. This was, um, I'm, as you can see here, I've been uh, drawing extinct animals, drawing animals for a long time. I remember when I was an eight-year-old, I drew this like, dodo extinction vignette. It's a live dodo looking sadly at a, a dodo carcass. It's like a macabre thing for an eight-year-old to draw, maybe. I don't know. Um, yeah, Lost Species Day Inktober was um, an initiative that I, well, um, obviously uh, Inktober is kind of a artistic thing and um, it's something that I wanted to have a go at just to kind of challenge myself and out of interest um, but also I thought that it would be interesting to um, have this as something for Lost Species Day and as you can see here with the artwork that I did I tried to have like a didactic element to it so this here is um, 
Myotragus balearicus, it's a balearian mouse goat. And that pine cone there, that was a very large pine cone. That's about, um, that's about accurate in terms of size comparison. This creature was about that kind of height. So a very small, very weird creature. Actually, it's worth Googling it in your spare time if you don't know about this. It's one of the weirdest mammals of the modern age. And another thing that I wanted to do with these was that I wanted it to, um, I made sure that they were all dedicated to extant species, extant relatives of theirs. So this one here is in honor of the mouflon, which is a vulnerable species. And I also tried to put in stuff that related to practical action or things that were worth knowing. And um, this one here is about, this one here is about um, which zoos are worth going to actually in terms of which zoos do the most for conservation. Uh, said here that um, best zoos will provide a lot of field based and captive conservation and often the best zoos give a breakdown of their annual, spe of their annual spend online in terms of where they, um, where they spend their money. A lot of the most well known zoos will publish um, sort of pie chart where their money's spent, whether it's in situ, ex situ conservation, um, animal husbandry, etc., etc. And those are quite interesting to go over if you're um, interested in uh, zoos like I am. Uh, uh, it is a good way to pick out some of the best and some of the worst. It's not necessarily the ones you think, but I mean, sometimes it is, to be honest. Uh, uh, so in terms of coming towards um, conclusions about the value of reconstructing species that are recently lost and whose losses appear to be linked to our own kind. Uh, one of the first things I would say is that there is obviously, given that what has been talked about, um, although we don't know exactly how far back it is, that humans started being the driving factor in um, species loss on the earth. Um, we do know that now is very much the case. So by flagging up these issues in the past, um, the hope is that it will inspire people to take things, take it more seriously in the present. Because as things stand, you know, extinctions on a large scale are something that humans have caused, are causing and will continue to cause unless, um, you know, absent significant alterations in the way that we exist on the planet and the way that um, our societies are organised. It's also um, one of the reasons that I wanted to emphasise going a bit further back than say the last 500 years of extinctions, which is one thing that's often focused on, is that if it is the case that extinctions over the last 50,000 years, so if you go back to the megafauna and extinctions in Australia, if it is the case that a lot of those were driven by human activity, then to only look at the last 500 years in detail, you're looking at effectively 1% of the story of anthropogenic extinction. And I don't think it's wise to look at this huge issue, this huge ongoing issue, one of the defining problems of our time, through a small keyhole like that. Because I would imagine, I don't think it's, um, I don't think it's too much of a jump to suggest that, you know, the other um, 49,500 years might have some lessons in for us. But um, at the same time, although the issue is too big to be looked at on a small scale temporally, um, one of the values of reconstructing perhaps individual species is that it makes it real in a way that these sort of large statistics don't necessarily, particularly for people um, who aren't you know, aren't in a field where there's a lot of statistics or who don't relate well to numbers or that sort of thing. And I've found personally that um, with some of the reconstructions that I've done, particularly with the sloth that I showed you earlier, the acrotochnus, I found that working, that took me ages, and I found that um, like working on something like that, uh, like really paying attention to how it's put together and how it looks, you develop kind of uh, a weird sort of emotional bond with the species that you didn't have before. So the various, yeah, the various extinct species that I've spent time, I put, I've spent significant time drawing. I feel more of a sort of sense of a bond and emotional engagement with them, which um, I think I think is something that's worth having, personally. And where's that time? Okay, so uh, now I guess um, yeah. Thanks very much for listening. And if you have any questions, please feel free to ask.